So lately, I've been getting a lot of referrals from doctors and radiologists uh, literally saying, you know, you know, patients saying, yeah, my doctor said that I have a subluxation here and I have a subluxation in my neck or rib subluxation. And they're sending me their patients to me uh, with, you know, with the diagnosis of subluxation. I think it's terrific. So uh, this is something that it's, it's, it's really fun because years ago, 10, 15 years ago, uh, people were saying, you know, subluxations aren't real. Uh, so just for fun, I would try to go through the, the logic, you know, do subluxations exist? Uh, of course they do, um, but why don't we just go through it for fun um, and just talk about whether subluxations exist or not and whether they should exist. Uh, so first, the first thing I want to do is show you a triangle uh, because I like to pretend I'm Rene Descartes and talk about you know, this little sort of object that you recognize, it's a triangle and it, you, of course the shape with three sides and you know that it has certain properties that define it. Uh, it's a three-sided shape with, you know, if you add up the different angles, it adds up to 180 degrees. Uh, if you look at like the longest side, then that would have the largest angle opposite. Little things like this that are properties of it that maybe you know, obviously people had come up with all these things like I think Euclidean geometry. I looked up started maybe 300 BC, but people invented triangles long before that. But it's possible, I suppose, to go your whole life without knowing what a triangle is. You need somebody to teach you and say, you know, this is a triangle. Uh, but that's what it's defined as. And if it's there and you recognize it, you say that's a triangle because we've defined a triangle. We've defined our term. So when we define the term subluxation, before we decide, you know, does it exist, we have to define what it is. And there are lots of people who've discussed it uh, and, you know, to the point, uh, for example, the Rubicon group, they, they went through the, the subluxation, came up with this big, long definition, and I think it's the best definition so far. But even in their definition, it says we currently define uh, because the, the subluxation is this because it's subject to re revision, which is good science. Um, so a subluxation is I teach it to you, my patient. I teach it to you. I'm just going to say it's damage to the body that's caused by stress. It could be physical, emotional, or chemical, resulting in nerve interference and possibly spinal dysfunction, usually spinal dysfunction. So that's it. It's damage to the body caused by stress, physical, emotional, or chemical stress resulting in nerve interference and spinal dysfunction. So if you have this, if you have something like this and it's there, then it exists, right? Uh, so we just have to ask ourselves, is, is damage real? If you have damage to the spine, because that's what we're defining it is. It's damage to the body. Uh, yeah, it's damage to the body. Is it possible to have damage to your body? I think so. Um, is damage caused by stress? Yeah, it's hard to think of some type of damage that isn't caused by either a physical stress, an emotional stress, or chemical stress. Uh, so a physical stress would be an accident. That's what you're normally going to think of like, yeah, a sport injury or I fell or I was in a car accident. That's going to be a, a physical stress. Uh, an emotional stress is, you know, that also affects your body, right? Physically, it affects you physically. So it'll make your muscles tight. It'll change your posture if you're under emotional stress. Your level of emotional health affects your posture and affects you completely. It affects the vigor with which you behave. It changes the behavior of your body completely. You can even die instantly from emotional stress, okay? It's happened. Uh, so we know that, that emotional stress is bad. And then there's chemical stress. You know, if you drink too much caffeine, uh, or alcohol, that's going to change the way that your muscles behave. It's, if you're dehydrated, it's going to change the texture and flexibility of your muscles. It'll change all the reactions in your body. If you have an increase in toxicity, it's going to change uh, the, the, how quickly your body heals. Um, so that's, we know that damage is caused by stress. And so is, when your body's damaged, is it possible to have nerve interference? Well, yeah, I mean, if you have a physical stress, it's possible to have nerve interference to the point uh, where, let's say, it, 
it injures your spinal cord, that's the all you know a big sort of nerve interference. Um, hitting your head, that's a nerve. <laughs> That's nerve interference too. It's not, I don't know if I would call it a subluxation. It is technically, but it, you know, it, and it is something that I take care of too, but it is, you know, also nerve interference. Also emotional stress almost takes a hundred percent takes place in the neurology of your body. Uh, so that does interfere. If you're, if you're distracted, stressed out about something, you, it, it, you'll, you'll check out right so now we're interfering with your body it will change the way it'll change your posture just the way that i was saying before that's all nerve interference that's the mechanism how that works and if you have a chemical stress from caffeine that's also interfering with your nervous system it's making it more excitable uh, so now your nervous system isn't behaving properly so it's actually the nerve interference is where it starts when you have emotional and chemical stress and then it's it causes the physical problem which may be uh, you know, a twist in your spine or a, a tension in your body that changes the way that your spine is functioning. Which gets to the next thing, is spinal dysfunction possible? Of course it is. Nobody, I don't think anybody de debates any of these things individually. So I'm kind of going on and on about it, but I have to go through each of these things uh, because I just have to. So all of these things are possible just in the same way when we look back at our triangle, if we see a three-sided object shape and it all the things add up that is a triangle by definition when we define our terms of a subluxation and it's there yes the subluxation obviously exists um, for people who recognize it you could go your whole entire career your life and not know what the word subluxation is uh, many people do too many people do uh, unfortunately uh, so it obviously exists. And nowadays, all types of practitioners, medical doctors, like I said, I'm getting referrals from medical doctors. And I've heard about medical doctors doing this back in the 80s and 90s. And now to see it again is, a, is terrific. But uh, physios now it, it are doing research and using the term subluxation uh, and using, for example, Gonstead technique and, and treating people for subluxation in research as I'm reading this research and it's actually physios, which is really, I think that's really great, you know, because where I come from, that would be normally the sort of thing that they're, they're, they're not accepting, but you could see that there's a spectrum of people and that in each profession that accepts different things. And there's just been this renaissance of the term uh, subluxation, and it kind of coincides with the popularity now of things like uh, Ayurveda, yoga, meditation. Uh, Deepak Chopra is that example of in medicine where you can have a very, uh, almost a, like, a, not almost, but a very spiritual, almost mystical side to it. He's a medical doctor, but he's bringing in that Eastern kind of Ayurveda because it's extremely useful, clinically useful. And then you're gonna have the other side where they're, they're just gonna be more just just have a different sort of way of looking at things and i think you need that entire spectrum uh, to make everybody happy and to treat human beings i think there has to be uh to, to really maximize to get the most out of each profession you need to have this diversity where everybody's talking to each other and that's the way you get the most out of everything because human beings uh, aren't 100 um, percent predictable uh, we need the, this sort of diversity and to apply it individually to each person. So why even question it? Why, why did I bring this up? Well, first of all, the nature of science is to question it. I, I think it's important to go through these sort of these sorts of things. Uh, next, you know, when I went to school, the term in the 90s, um, the term subluxation wasn't used. Uh, we learned the term subluxation. Actually, uh, one of my, my school was one of the few schools to remove su the term subluxation uh, from our curriculum. It was actually used in the, in, you know, basically it was only used in the chiropractic uh, history <laughs> class. So although I'm very grateful, I think I did have one of the best educations possible in chiropractic, maybe. Um, I we didn't learn that. Uh, so fortunately, I was able to, to learn that elsewhere afterwards. 
Um, but I think there's a really big a, a renaissance, like I said before, where people are using the term because it is so accessible to people. People get it. Uh, when I, you know, I practiced 13 years without using the word subluxation in my practice, even though I believed in it, uh, I, I, in the concept, I didn't use it because I was afraid of the, the consequences. And then as I started to, you know, over the course of like maybe 10 years ago, it started to become more mainstream and more comfortable. And then I was like, yeah, it's fine. And people actually really liked it. When I was teaching them about subluxation, they kind of get it. They, they start to understand everything that we're doing. But the reason that I think we didn't want to use it was because we wanted to fit in. Other practitioners weren't using the term subluxation and it made us feel weird. Um, and some chiropractors are still thinking this way that we have to kind of fit in with everybody else. We already do, I think, we, or, you know, and even if we don't, who cares? I don't care. So either way, uh, fitting in, I don't, and, you know, using the similar language since they don't use the word subluxation or they didn't, they don't use it in medical school. If I'm teaching my patients what a subluxation is, if I'm teaching you right now, then you, you know. Um, so I've never, you know, a lot, some of the reason they, they would say, you know, the, the, the word subluxation in medicine means something different than it does for a chiropractic subluxation, but I've never been had a moment where it was ever confusing. I have medical doctors who come in and see me and they're like, I have a subluxation at T6 and I have heartburn or T5 and I have heartburn. And they'll tell me this and they're like, I, I really need you to adjust me uh, because I feel like I'm subluxated. Uh, so it's all just a matter of context. When you come into this office and you say the word subluxation at a chiropractic office, it means a certain thing. Just like uh, the, word, the word joint is a good um, example uh, if you are talking to a chiropractor about a joint, we're going to be talking about a joint in your finger. It means a different thing, or anywhere in your body, it means a different thing like than with a, uh, a carpenter, where it's a joint in wood that's glued together or they're folded together. And that means something different still to a stoner, where it's like a completely <laughs> different thing, right? So, and it's never, ever confusing because you're using the word in context, you know what we mean. Uh, so it's kind of ludicrous to, to think, oh, well, we want, we want to use the same language as they do because we're gonna have our own terms and our own language in order to make things uh, to benefit us uh, the best way possible. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, Eskimos, I was looking earlier today, uh, is, and you know, classically they say Eskimos have, they used to, I don't know, Lots of words for snow. It turns out they have 40 to 50, according to this uh, article on kinternational.com. Inuit have 40 to 50 words for snow. I actually found out, I scrolled down, according to them, the Scots have 421 words for snow. So like a fiefel is snow swirling around a corner. Uh, Flindricken is a light snow shower. So because the weather is something that we're you know, uh, we're looking at every single day, it makes sense that we need to describe this. And, you know, even for a normal person, you know, if you're a skier, uh, there's a drastically different meaning if I say avalanche compared to if I say snow. Um, if there's, if I yell snow, you're going to be like, yeah, so what? If I yell avalanche, that means that there's a hunk of snow the size of a bus rushing towards you and about to end your life. <laughs> so they mean drastically different things. You're, you're, to be able to express these things with your language is very, very important. Um, one of the things we want to understand when we're treating subluxation, you know, stress causes subluxation. So when we're treating subluxation, it, review, it reduces the effects of stress. Um, and, you know, that's all that a chiropractor is doing really when they're treating you for sub treating a subluxation or you know adjusting you for subluxation they're reducing the effects of the stress on your body and that can affect so many wide just a almost everything that happens in your body because stress is just so bad for you and we're all under stress physical emotional and chemical so it's important to have your spine checked by a chiropractor bye